everyone in that. It's a great movie. Just watch it. It's really like, it's war. Yeah, German can only do war. And all that. <laughs> but it's really, really good movie, right? It lets you feel what it really means. And it was to be shot in that. with this technique. No. Lensvid's coverage of IBC 2023 is brought to you by Ulanzi Video Accessories, Small Rig, Small Rig, Big Dreams, Jiyun, Make It Real, and Godox, Embrace Creative Possibilities. Hi, we're at IBC 2023, and we're at the Top Crane booth, which are letting us use this fantastic uh, location. And we're talking with Nicolas from the Media Division. Hi there. Hello, Nicolas. Hello. Uh, so first of all, it's great meeting you in here in the uh, IBC. And, oh, thank uh, you. I, I like. I, I love being around. You know, it's like being a bit in a chocolate factory. <laughs> uh, you have all the the new goodies. I'm, I'm I'm one of the few people in the industry who's really like passionate about these things. I can really go like, <laughs> when I walk through things like here and see all all the nice toys. You know. What what, <laughs> uh, what specific toys did you see that are uh, interesting? Or uh, you, you've been here since yesterday, I think. Yeah, yeah, I've been here yesterday. So, um, as if you know my channel, uh, we are a lot on um, on bots, on robots. On, so I see a lot of the small, compact robots, and it's really a development there. The price are coming down, and the uh, systems get more practical, more compact, lighter. So I'm I'm very like interested in how that development, in the evolution of. I'm, I'm actually all control. with you. With, we've done one with the uh, Zinema Motion, which is a relatively yeah. small robot, but you're saying Loki, that... Loki, yeah, right. Loki, yeah. right. Uh, and they, I think they have a bigger version now. Uh, yes. It's called Thor, yes. which is like bigger. 34,000, which is, I think, for that bigger re version. Relative, yeah, something that like is, that. It, it is money, of course. Uh, so it's not but, a glorified slider. No, no, but, yeah, for sure. Um, it's something that is in a range where uh, it's really accessible for a whole different... Uh, kind of shooter, and that makes it interesting for me. I'm still waiting for something like 10,000. I agree. Yeah. Uh, that is mobile enough to take, for example, on a wildlife shoot and put it in a lion's cave. You can and just film the kids with a remote, something I, like that. I'm no. thinking for, from our perspective, I'm looking for just like this, something like below 10,000, but something that you can put on a table like with a clamp. Yeah. That can be interesting. The whole problem with these kind of robots, uh, I, I hear with, uh, I talk with the guys around the corner, I just don't have the name on, my, on top of my sleeve. They do the software for it. You can basically have a uh, uh, three year, uh, you can use any bot, you can use a KUKA basically from eBay, from old factory. Yeah and use their software and it's it's perfect for really? that. Uh, and they always tell you that the small robots really have an issue with vibrations. It's, it's just kinetics. The, uh, no, the, the heavier yeah. the, the robot, the more stable it is. This is Actually, why yeah. the big ones are and more stable. And if you stable. have a small one that runs on a V-Log battery, for example, uh, probably not be what you really expect. Yeah, but yeah. we see technology, you know. Yeah, it, it will improve over time. I'm guessing maybe they can add some stabilization, uh, you know, in, in either in post or in the robot itself somehow. Yeah, to, yeah. yeah, probably. Oh. Yes. Like, talk to TGI, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, can, that can definitely right. be. Maybe so, combine something. Yeah, you're, you're very well into like lenses. So have you been seeing, have you seen any interesting oh, yes, lenses? Yes, yes, I've seen uh, many interesting lenses actually. Uh, we are doing, we've been, I have had uh, the DZO Pabos, for example, that's the 2X anamorphic that are light enough to go on a gimbal, for example. And that's the Novum and they're like uh, uh, 5,000 euro a piece or 5,100 a piece, uh, which is very affordable. And we had them already for three weeks because we are collaborating with DZO for an episode, for a test episode. I've been shooting two days ago on a robot, doing some John Wick style things. And they look very, very good. So I'm, I'm, that's an interesting product, I think. We've just been at the Nisi Boost and we saw the Athenas, which is for an entry level set, like 5,000 for the whole set. Five lenses. That's, that's very that affordable. Is, that's good and they're balanced. So you can get them on, uh, on the gimbal and everything. So they're, they're also very small. Filmmakers, yeah. yeah, this is very, very interesting lenses, I think. And there's so many other things. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's, it's, <laughs> you, you have to be here for a full yeah. week, and then even then, it's it's not enough to cover up. Everything. Looking forward to look at the Burano, for example. Oh yeah, yeah, that yes. is. Uh, we have a Sony Kids interview small. just after that, so maybe we will have some, you know, shots. We'll just of the... come over and go like this from the <laughs> side. <Put it> <laughs> 
<laughs> Can I get this one? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think that a lot of people who watch your channel, you know, want to know how do you actually make those the videos, the, the production value for people who don't know, you should really watch the, the Media Division channel. It has some incredible content. We have <laughs> some- Avi, he's the director of Top Gear. <laughs> and he does this shit. Yeah, he, he loaned Avi's us the, the, the location to actually shoot. And, and he has he some- speak Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> And he doesn't speak Hebrew, but he loaned us this uh, magnificent booth with this location to, to shoot in. But yeah. no, uh, getting back to your channel, you do productions which, I know, in my book would take months. So how do you actually do, you know, what's your, uh, your method for producing like a new episode on your channel? Well, my usual thing is either, of course, there is some interesting lens or so that comes in and say like, hey, you want to have a look at that? And we do that or we don't. Depends on if I find it interesting or not. Um, I like vintage lenses, as, as you know. And I always, if I have the time, I like to explore a new branch of it. Of course, it's very expensive for us because you have to basically build a set because I can't go out and rent a set. I have nothing to say about them when I use them for two days. Maybe you can say something them. about the, the sub that uh, you, you mentioned, we talked about before in your last episode. The, the yeah, what well, that was a ProTube episode of Laowa. So this is a, one of the cases where the uh, uh, manufacturer, in this case Laowa, came like, hey, we have something new. And it was a bit of a special uh, situation here because the Marmalade, which I collaborate a lot with, it's friends of mine and I do a lot of behind the scenes for them and case films, stuff like that. And uh, I really, really love them and they're such professionals. It's beautiful to work with them. And you know, in our business, you don't have uptime all the time. You don't have jobs all the time. So when they so have when, some free time. Yeah, exactly. And they have some people who need some trainees or something. They say like, hey, if you ever got a good idea, just go for it. And they use, for example, the probe lenses a lot like the old ones no. from, from La Oa and higher end ones. But you know, it depends. Sometimes the the pro the, the old pro from La Oa is just fine. Yeah, we, and, we use them and you know. Right, right, right. And they do that on, on, on shots for Nutella and for, for, for Michelob or on Heineken and all that. Yeah, so it is used professionally. And that's what's so special about the La Oa Pro Blends. Is it that it was some 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 amateur photographer uses it in a wood to get a, a spider and you see it on, on high-end high end, motion control yeah. rigs uh, yeah. shooting high-end commercials. So very versatile. So they got this new lens out, the ProTube, and they asked me, you want to you check that out? And as I know that the marmalade would be like, ah, <laughs> yeah, because you save actually, it's a T8. So potentially you could save half of your uh, energy uh, that you put in there. And you, if you have a high speed set, it's ridiculous. It looks like you walk into uh, a scene from Poltergeist, you know, like, ah, it's like everything <laughs> like, you're blind when you walk out there. Anyhow, uh, so I said, like, you want to do something? Uh, they said, yes, but I, I don't like to say, like, this is a chart, this is a girl, this is a cake. You know, it's, it's boring. You want and something more, more interesting. I'm a filmmaker by heart, so I look for something that fits that. And I always wanted to do dry for wet, uh, which is a technique that was mostly in the pre-CG uh, area, like when you watch like Hunt for Red October or something like that, you see like this amazing underwater shots and they're not really underwater. <laughs> um, they are shot in a room that's really strongly hazed. Usually the models are like seven, eight, 10 meters. And so you don't have to, because the density of the, of the haze is basically the more room you have, the thicker the haze looks on camera, mm. right? So you have a big model and quite a distance to the camp, there's a lot of haze between them. We have a small model. Ours was like one meter 40 of a second uh, World War uh, uh, German submarine. Yeah. And um, so uh, we have to let a lot more haze in. You couldn't see this far in, in this little tent that we built. Um, but here's the interesting thing story-wise, because I really wanted it, now you get the story. Uh, uh, there's one German movie where I say like that's the one you have to see we don't have many of those I'm sorry <laughs> and that's Das Boot it's from I think 1980 if I remember correctly it's Wolfgang Petersen that made his movie everyone in that it's a great movie just watch it it's really like it's war yeah German can only do war and all that. <laughs> but it's really really good movie right it lets you feel 
what it really means. And, and it was to be shot in that. with this technique? No, it was no? shot actually in a pool. Oh. At least the exteriors of the shot. And they had, for example, a, a life size one. It doesn't oh. have an engine, they just towed it uh, through the harbors and stuff. What, a life size sub? No. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's, a, it's a life size replica of a sub. No, and it's basically the same one you saw in the episode that they use in the Indiana Jones scene because they shot in La Rochelle at the You're same time. You're talking like 30 meter long sub or something yeah, yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Then it was actually built for, uh, for the sport wow. and Spielberg asked Peterson, can I have that? <laughs> Bring uh, me that. For, for Indiana Jones and, and Peterson said like, eh, okay. And <laughs> I think they changed something on the boat and Peterson was not happy, but it's, that's a complete other story. So when they shot it in a pool, with the same DOP that later did uh, um, Robocop and uh, uh, Total Recall and Starship Troopers, that's um, Jus Vacano. He's, oh, okay. uh, uh, I think he's right in, in his 90s now. He's still alive. Wow. And I, I recently just went to the phone book, found his name and called him. So he's a nice guy. And <laughs> you see how I'm, how I'm working. Yeah, on it's, like, it's you can't like... just talk to these people. And, uh, Wolfgang Peterson is on record that he has the beginning is a very, very iconic shot. It's a bit like Star Wars, where you go under the, the star uh, destroyer in the, in ah, the, in okay. the first yeah, yeah, Star Wars, yeah, yeah. Uh, A New Hope. Uh, you go under the star destroyer and it's this iconic shot. And the boat tried something quite similar and it's just after, it came out just after Star Wars basically. So you can see that Wolfgang got his imp the and he same wanted to go under the, sub. the submarine. And they just couldn't do it. They shot for six six weeks and, and, and it was... And the whole a, thing was shooting underwater? Yeah, they, it was in a big pool and the boat was like three meters long or something like that. And oh, they so. did all the exteriors with, with live water bombs, charges. It looks excellent in the video, oh. yeah? But what he wanted to do with that shot, he couldn't. They just couldn't pull it off. Uh, and when you see uh, behind the scenes photos of it, you totally get why this wouldn't work. Uh, now we say like, we can do what you he wanted. He, he is deceased, unfortunately, Wolfgang Peterson. So we thought like it would be a nice to get, to give him a farewell by doing the shot like he intended it to, to it. look. And the only way to do it actually is to go this close to the boat. Wow. And you can see it in the ProTube episode that we did it's right like, for wet, like they did yeah. on the right and just fly with a lens under the thing. And you can't get that close if you use a normal macro lens. You mm. use a tube lens. Uh, in this kind of like a periscope style you lens. use the periscope version of the lens for this shot um, yeah well or the, the 35 three lenses yeah, and yeah. you have this one that goes like yeah around the corner yeah. not really a periscope which goes like this but it looks like this it's like angled yeah but they call it periscope yeah, yeah whatever sure. but this one is perfect you could use other for it but this one was from the thinking the easiest in that case so you do you did something yeah. like this exactly you fly like this yeah under the boat and it's really like most of the time you got this much space between the boat and the lens because it's so wide angle. How much and time did it take you to to, to program it? Yeah, that one move. Half I a think day? it's about an hour. Thanks oh, to Niklas it? Eichten, which is the spike operator for that ah, shop, okay. and he doesn't do it all the time, so he he's a bit rusty. He says himself, <laughs> but he's excellent. He did uh, such hours, a great nothing, job, you not know. over taking it. Just yep, give me yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, got it, got it, got it. We ride through on it. It's brilliant. Thanks, Niklas. Very, very, <laughs> very cool shot. Um, Fantastic. So we had that in the episode, and that's the whole backstory. If that is not too much for you, no, no, no. Watch that's, the that's episode. What, yeah, I think yeah, for sure. We watch have a episode. pretty cool result it's for it. And something negative about you know, we do mistakes. So you everybody, everybody does mistakes. So yeah. our audience doesn't ask to, you know, and that's interesting. We never did dry for wet before, and you encounter things that you don't expect. For example, the haze in the room was so thick that the vents from my Marvel LF Kinefinity camera that we used for that shot sucked in the smoke and blew it between the sensor on the Ola PF. And we, we saw the image over time muddying up and having strange artifacts. We're like, what is this? And we cleaned the lens and we cleaned the It was the in the PF. sensor? It was under the Ola PF. And I have to have, to have a talk with Kinefinity about that. I'll meet them later. <laughs> no, but it's it's cleanable. I mean, you can, well, I spent the next night with, with a bunch of tech wipes and, and alcohol, and it took me a couple of hours to clean, to clean it. it. I yeah. kind of got it clean. So when you watch that episode, the the shots with the um, the test shot on Spike Robot going through the car and everything through the it Volkswagen was, Beetle, yeah, that's already after the cleaning. 
I, I like that because you, you compare the original uh, probe uh, lens, like yeah. I think the straight one to the new one, and you can yeah. definitely see the difference. Uh, absolutely, definitely. What you would expect just by being able to close down. Uh, so if you, you shoot him on T16 both, yeah. the Pro 2 definitely looks better, because, like you would expect when you close down a slightly bigger aperture lens. And I think yeah. for that alone, if you do it professionally... You need to buy that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a no-brainer, yeah. you know, it's not that expensive. Uh, Depending well, the on set, the budget that you work yeah, with, yeah, but well, for sure, yeah. Eight and a half thousand euros is the set, and for you the can set. buy them... Uh, three you just need this. 2,800, 3,000, yeah, exactly something like that. Exactly, for the straight yeah. version. I think that is... Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just do it, right? <laughs> for, for a situation like yeah. that. I, I want to ask you again, yeah. so you, 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 sp you spoke a little bit about uh, how you're actually making those videos. What's your background? I think that that's a question because you, you know so much about so many topics like lenses and amorphic. And, <laughs> well, so where are you coming from? You're coming from the, the film industry or? No, I, no absolutely not. I, I, I studied graphic design. Uh, no, I didn't even study that. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I, I taught myself you're everything in life. Yeah, exactly. Autodidact, as we say in German. <laughs> I don't know the English term. Yeah, no, it's, it's same? the same, the okay. same thing. Very nice. So yeah, um, actually, I learned uh, advertising originally, but on a on a uh, management level. So I'm doing contacts, stuff like that. Uh, so I can write a concept, and that helps me quite well uh, today too, because I'm doing the whole process, and this is one of the interesting things for me because I have it all in my hand. I can all play that through in my head for an hour or two. Then, like, that's a good idea. Yeah, and does it work? Does it work in a production scale? What's the story? Because as a filmmaker, you're a storyteller. And this is like this once upon a time picture. Yeah, and it's really that mechanic that a story should have. If you're producing yeah. like a 40, I think most of your episodes are close to an hour, 40 something minutes. Depends. Absolutely. You need to yeah. tell a story because otherwise it's just going nowhere, basically. Right, right, exactly. It's not an interview, it's, it's you're telling something so, to the sometimes audience. Sometimes they can have like the Pro Tour, baby, it's more episodic, you know, if you're a test part. Yeah, okay. And then you have a whole like the history of driving. But even bad. but even then there is a story, as you said, you yeah. know, you, you were telling about the, the, the sub and it, yeah. it, you, you are saying something. There's yeah. little stories inside it, yeah. you know. But, Sometimes I have an over overarching bigger story. For example, one of our most uh, successful videos in terms of views is 1 million views for the F0.7. But I'm a big Kubrick fan. If you know my channel, I'm a huge Kubrick fan. Not so much because I find his videos so, uh, his videos. Films. His films <laughs> I don't so think that he would like to make videos. Usually not, they are like sometimes even hard to bear. Like if you watch 2001, yeah. here you go like, <laughs> oh, it, it's lengthy, you know? Yeah. Eyes <laughs> wide shot is also, yeah. well, that's... Uh, exactly. Yeah. But what he figured out is every movie he did is absolutely iconic. And I love that. And that's why I call my epic episode the epic episodes, because in a much, much smaller context like YouTube, we try to do the same. We try to give something unique, something absolutely iconic to each and every episode just in it by itself. If you watch it, you don't expect that. And you go like, no, that's interesting. <laughs> that's unique, that's different. Just like Kubrick did. And I think that the working, pro uh, the, the process of Kubrick working, that is something very interesting. Because I think a lot of the guys that do movies, Danny Villeneuve or whoever, go into a movie and think of the story first. I don't think that Kubrick did that. So uh, what was his, uh, his thought of... Uh, this, I think he's a nerd. He's a complete nerd. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the king of the nerds, yeah. so uh, this is not so negative. It's not a negative, uh, <laughs> it's yeah. not a negative vibe. I'm a nerd by heart, and it's totally fine to be a nerd. Um, you go in there and you, in, into a project with a certain idea uh, that is, in case of Kubrick, a technical. For example, I think Barry Linton, he was all about, what does it look like to shoot faster and faster? No, he stood in front of a painting, like from uh, like a period piece from the 18th century or something. Saw like this candlelight uh, image. Said, well, I, I want that. This is what I want. I want to shoot something that looks like this, which is completely impossible in its own time. Yeah. Because they don't have the ISO. So they developed the, the 0 0.7 exactly. lens. Yeah, exactly. So you have film that is much, much slower than sensors today. You have a hundred ISO, something like that, and you can push that in post like one stop, so you can get two hundred ISO 
grainy look out of it. And then if you want to shoot with candles, that ain't going to work. Right. So you use a lot of reflectors. You use brighter candles with three... Uh, 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 little, dots, uh, yeah. Uh, see, word missing. <laughs> uh, and so they burn brighter. But you still, to get anywhere close to what you need, you need to shoot at f0.7. Yeah. And there's just no lens that quick. Uh, so they made one. One. Yeah. And that is the one, the famous size Planar that NASA built, uh, that size built for Four. the Apollo missions of NASA. They built 10 lenses, kept two, I think, On the gave three to, uh, gave three to um, Kubrick, who just went in there and said, like, can I have these? I mean, the balls, the balls. And again, this is something I got from Kubrick. I called size and said, like, can I use the Planar? And they said, like, well, we have one in the museum here, but you can't because the flange is too short uh, to use it with your camera. I said, oh, that's it. I didn't know that. Yeah. So in this, again, the whole research, but I talked to size, I made the research on how they modified the cameras because you can't have a, okay, you need this much flange to get to infinity with a 0.7 lens. That's a physical thing. Yeah. And behind it, in a normal camera, you need a prism or a, a mirror so you can see anything. Yeah. If you need every bit of light, you don't use a prism, you yeah. use a mirror. And Kubrick had a camera that usually uses a prism, but he modified that already to a, a mirror one. Okay. So when the film is transported, the mirror goes up, and you can see actually what you're shooting for framing and focus, yeah. things like that, you know, not important. <laughs> <laughs> now, you need four millimeter flange. Not a big deal today if you're willing to modify a camera because you see what the sensor see. Yeah. But back in that day, yeah, you don't you, see you, anything. You, 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 so how did, how did it work? Oh, they, they did two tricks in that case. They had one video camera like on the lens oh. to give you an idea of the framing, uh. but you can't pull focus with it because yeah. you don't see what the focus is. Yeah. So what you do is for every shot, you, you really make the distance and you have a camera from that side, a video camera. On the monitor, you just paint in your thing with markers, like this is 10 meters, two meters. <laughs> so when you see the people, you can pull focus on that by people walking like on wow, the axis. that's that's so it, it, complicated. It, it, it's that's very complicated. Yeah, and, you know the rest of the story to Kubrick was came this, after uh, that. He said, "Like I want that. This is what I have to do." So he had the idea had for a specific yeah. scene, and the entire story was yeah. built around that. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I don't know that. I, oh, this okay. is what I suspect uh, how I his see. brain works. He yeah. never said like this is how I work. Yeah. No, it's just my sus it's suspicion because I work the exact same yeah. way in my brain. <laughs> so like, and then you write the story where that fits in. Yeah. And I think that because Barry Lynn, the story is like, okay, you know, <laughs> but that's the interesting yeah. part. And to not make it a one trick monkey, he built in the zooms, uh, <laughs> one trick donkey, sorry. <laughs> um, he built in the zoom shots and, and anything to make it more, and of course the stories are right. Yeah, and of course. But it's not the point. Same for 2001. I, I'm, uh, I think the suspicion is that he was thinking about the, uh, the, the stage that the 360, so, yeah. yeah, where he runs around. I think that's he wanted to do a shot like that, thinking about science fiction. And then the, and the, the entire story developed around, around yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is your starting point. And I do. And, a and this is the way that you're process. doing your episodes, the same way. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yes. And this is whole. Uh, this is why I love Kubrick because we're like nerds. You, and, you and have the same uh, you know, mind, mind. And I suspect that uh, uh, that we are. I like I like Kubrick because I suspect that is the same process. So, but of course I can do different things. I sometimes it's story driven, of course, but I'm actually, as I'm a nerd, I'm more interested in the, the concept driven things than I'm in story based things. Have you ever had an idea to actually do something which is not like a lens review or basically like, like something which is actual cinematic for, for the sake of uh, doing something. Abs cinematic. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I have, I, I wrote scripts, not finished them. Like every script writer in the world never <laughs> finishes a script. It's a work in progress that I have uh, for an episodic uh, TV show, um, a bit of... Um, so there is a chance that we will see something from you, which is well, like, if, besides if, like if YouTube. If Netflix knocks on my door, I wouldn't say no, but <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, it is so far off. Uh, my 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 working life at the moment that I don't see it happen immediately. Uh, but maybe you know, I didn't see me here ten years ago at all. So we talked about this earlier. 
I'm, I, I'm not doing this forever. I've been uh, advertising, I said, I'm an advertiser. And I started filming because, you know, when you're a graphic designer like I was at that time, you have a certain attitude to the image. And like, like Kubrick, I, it was more about the image and then it was about the story. Because if it was about the story, you take a video camera, make a story. But I went, I'm not interested in it. I want this image. I want this cinema. Ah! You know? <laughs> and no camera could give me that. Or at that time uh, where I started to, to film or to take this half as serious, there was nothing. Nothing. We're talking, what, 10, 10 years, years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the Ari Alexa wasn't there yet. Red was just... Uh, starting... Was just starting, or it was 12 years maybe. Yeah. Starting to talk about the Red uh, and that it will be a cool camera, the Red one. And I had a GH1 and a DVX100. So I was making film, but here's an interview, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, the the industry the, developed the so much in this time frame. Yeah, amazing. Allowing, like independent filmmaking because before that you had like huge crews and and like super expensive cameras and now you can do all this with a team of one or a few like people with relatively inexpensive gear so for me an aha moment was i got the uh, gh1 uh one of the first well, was uh, even... cameras mirrorless camera no no, no. It yeah. was, uh, the, the, the 5D was basically the, the, well, that's the, the a, that was a DSLR, point. yeah. And uh, the yeah, mirrorless, right, right, you're right, from the mirrorless. But it wasn't, for me, I didn't get this with the plan, you know, I just yeah. got it because whatever, you know, uh, it was a step up from the DVX100 that was in my thing, and it was HD, and you know, oh, well, let's look at that. And I just used it for like whatever. And uh, a friend of mine, who loves like mafia movies said like I, I'm marrying can you make a, a marriage and I, said, and I said like do you mind if I turn this into the godfather kind of and he said of course not and his whole friends and we, we he, they married on the Ripperbahn which is the red light district in Hamburg and I thought it was a good theme for it like uh, and I did it with Gossi, uh, with uh, music from Morricone and and all in black and white all shot and and it was awesome and I didn't know I could do it I had no <laughs> idea that I've never tried it but I did this whole thing and put on an Italian accent and told the story of the family that me. <laughs> and got some guys from there and said like, here's a prop gun, here's some knives. <laughs> now uh, kick and shoot the shit out of somebody on the ground. So <laughs> make some assassin stories and put a uh, uh, thing about somebody. So Shh, I'll tell you the story, I'll tell you, you know? And it was good, it was fun. What, what happened to that? Uh, it, it's on YouTube? What, what did you do with no, it? No, no, no. It's a wedding. It's probably. Ah, okay. Oh, yeah, right. I can't do that. <laughs> but it, it's fun. It's not from today's perspective. It's nothing great. Yeah. But for my first thing. And that yeah, was, for sure. And that was like maybe 12 or 11 years ago. And I, and I licked blood. <laughs> and, and the first camera then where I said like, okay, this was really the start. is exactly when the GH4 came out. Because that was for the first time a camera where I said like, this is a camera I can afford. That makes kind of sense in my context. And that gives images that are actually worth my time. <laughs> and I really grew from there, like, yeah. very fast. And, and now, now you're working with Alexas and, you know, whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now I recently bought an Alexa just for, actually just for the fun of it. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure about a lot of people saying I bought an Alexa just for the fun of it. But it's not a new one. I wish I could afford <laughs> one. But, you know, I always said, like, back in the days when I got the GH4, I said, like, I'd rather have an Alexa. No shit, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I always thought, like, if I had Alexa, I could, blah, blah, blah. But is that really true? Yeah. That's the thought process. And of what do you nerd, think right? now? Right? So I, I, now I got the uh, Alexa XTM which is a very weird camera because nobody has it. Yeah. It came out right before the Mini came out. And it's the exact same sensor like the Mini. It does better frame rates. It does 75 uh, frames per second raw. And because the Mini came out, uh, I already dropped this concept mm. because you can take off the hat. Because when you have a classic or an XT, a classic one uh, from Ari, it's an infrastructure problem. You need, if you put, want to put it on slider, you need a gigantic slider. You need a gigantic tripod because that camera, if you rig it up, it's like 14 kilos or whatever, you know, with a yeah. monitor and everything. So you're not going to handheld that. And if you put it on the shoulder, you're, you're going to ruin your back. Right. So the M is different. You can take the head and you have a, a uh, the, the box to yeah. the body and work with that. Sony it's, has been doing this recently with, uh, yeah, with their camera. 
exactly. They have the Venice with the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And um, the concept in itself, it's so unpractical. It's not really meant for, 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 for single shooters. Yeah, no, for sure. I know. But man, I got that thing. It was on a helicopter before from the States. Or, or bought it on eBay, Adorama, whatever, for 6,000 bucks. It's uh, not a lot. You have to invest quite a bit into media and everything because yeah. it's it's a pest. Yeah. But I always wanted to have an Alexa because I thought like it's certain magic to it because you're used to that. The, the, the Hollywood of the last 10 years was dominated by Alexa and that ingrained this image into your brain. So I took this dream that I had when I bought the GH4 and made it real, spent 6,000 for it. And the camera only has 500 hours. No, oh, that's If you nothing. buy an Alexa, M, uh, Alexa Mini right now, it has like 20,000 hours and you have to still pay 20,000 bucks for it. You know? And, so, and do you see the difference between what you worked with before and what you're shooting now? Yes. <laughs> and I still see a difference between modern cameras and the Alexa XT. Um, in the next episode, I will do one about the magic sauce, or I call it the cinematic episode. I've been working about it for a while. This is like a non-length uh, related episode, yeah. as lens too, because really want to talk about this magic sauce. I think when you start out and you're, you you grew up in the 80s, 90s, and you have this classic cinema look, you're like, that's what I want. That is what I want. No? And then you take out your video your video camera or your camcorder or your DSLR or your, your mirrorless, and it's not that. Yeah. And you think, why what, is it not what's that? What's the difference? And yeah. then you go like, and the one, one people will tell you, it's the lighting, it's all that, it's just the acting, it's just, it's all of it, you know? And it's all true in a way, and it's what I call the magic sauce, right? You do all the ingredients in the big pot, but you can tell if it's a fish soup or a beef soup or if it's salty or sweet, right? So there are ingredients in the soup that are more or less important. And this whole episode, and I'm not there yet, I'm still writing the you're, story, you're still in the I'm process. still experimenting, so, because I really want to explore how much, per, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, to quantize things, you know? Uh, and if you can't put your finger on it, exactly. what, what it works. So my, how much percentage does the lens have in the... So, so if I had the money, like if I had 10,000 euros to invest in something, to improve... What, what is the best, like yeah, the lens, the it, camera, something else? Bingo. Yeah. Or, the lighting, When I you know. say like the camera, is it practical aspects so I can move it better? Or is it is it the sensor? Or should I look more after Codex? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You see, it's complex. Yeah. It's, and there are a lot of aspects. I can already tell you, of course, that the most important part is what happens in front and behind the camera. No, no shit. Yeah. yeah. So I can take a, a, a GoPro and send it through a war zone or put it on a Formula One car. Intrinsically, that image will be more interesting. Interesting, yeah. Than filming my toilet Just, at home, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> with Alexa, Alexa with your, with a, with your toilet, with a Panavision lens, and put it on my toilet. <laughs> it's not gonna be a good a cinematic image. <laughs> so it's then I say like it's the movement. And I say like, well, there's so many movements where you have static cameras, especially the epic ones, because yeah. they have this huge cameras that um, you can't just trivially move, right? Yeah. You have a lot of uh, scenes in 2009 where the camera is just locked, yeah. and it's fine. You see. It's not always the movement, but they have this amazing sets. It really helps, you know? So what is the magic sauce and how do you get to a cinematic image easily? And there's tricks, of course, lighting. So, But if you just take the, the camera, that is an interesting part. And I'm gonna do a spoof again. And if you're on my Instagram or so, you might have seen that already. Uh, this one's not gonna be aliens or, uh, you know, I do the spoof on my yeah, channel yeah. a lot. I, I, where I be, I am in the movie, uh, play one part in it and have fun with it, <laughs> changing the story around. I did Aliens, I did The Shining, I did Blade Runner for the scope. Uh, and this time it's going to be The Silence of the Lambs. Oh. And uh, with the... Yeah, because I'm um, your lector. Yeah. You no, know? you get the joke. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, have some, uh, try to put me in, in Hannibal's position being locked up in that thing. And it's always fun to do to replicate the lighting, and you learn so much about cinematography, yeah. because each and every situation when you go into something is like aliens or something, uh, you say like, how did they do the lighting on that, or how do I replicate? 
with my shitty life. Shitty and, and smaller budgets and less crew and everything. Right, and these things, it usually takes a lot of while and it's some um, music. I can't go do it in the studios of the Marmalade with the HMI lights and stuff like that because it just takes too long. You know, I just blocked the, it too long. So I do this in my living room just with a little uh, green screen behind me and very, very uh, small, normal um, LED lights. Like, what everybody has in his in his pocket, you could do it too. So it, this is not a gear thing. Yeah. This is totally just, just uh, a, thinking a story or yeah. Yeah, you do the story, you think about it, you put some effort in the grade, uh, uh, use the right tools, right? Uh, yeah. To the right. And there's nothing about that that not everybody can, can do, do if you really try. And you said, which gives us basically the the end of the story in this case. How do you do this? I try. <laughs> And if I can do it, I try, try harder. Again. I try again. And that's the whole trick to it. I think that what I'm doing on my channel, anyone can do can do that. You just have to do it, right? That's, that's I think, a fantastic ending to our interview. Thank you very, very much. Thank Nicholas. you. This was a long yeah. one. I hope you can fit yeah. it in somewhere. No, we, we, we <laughs> probably can find, find a way. And uh, be sure to watch the media division. They have fantastic uh, content uh, there and an upcoming, hopefully, very interesting secret sauce episode. Uh, yeah, uh, we call it the, the cinematic episode. The cinematic. There's a working title. I don't know yet, but the whole uh, spoof uh, from the, uh, the Silence of Lamb will be uh, breaking the silence because it's like I talk with uh, other cinematographers, but they think what the magic sauce is. Oh. Okay. So thank you for listening to all that rambling <laughs> and uh, see you on the channel. See you. Bye bye.